दीपाश्रुतम मोहतम प्रमाथी चौराद्य हार्यम परम धनम च सम्मोह शत्रु व्यथनाय शस्त्र नयोपदेष्टा परम मंत्री नयोपदेष्टा परम मंत्री Varanasi is believed to be the oldest inhabited city on earth its origins lost in the mists of time the city has since earliest memory been a center for knowledge and spiritual contemplation the kind that leads the sincere adept to a profound inner transformation varanasi has been a melting pot of cultures and philosophical traditions since ancient times In the bounds of this great and holy city one still finds eminent scholars of all the major Indian philosophical traditions it is a place where scholars and practitioners from different schools of thought challenged and shared their views with one another honing and modulating their own perspectives through vibrant and respectful debate it is no surprise that the buddha was drawn to come here after his profound awakening beneath the bodhi tree at bodgaya it was at sarnath in the deer park where the buddha approached a skeptical group of ascetics and gave his first teaching on the path of dharma eliciting in them the devotion to become his first five disciples from this first teaching A vast and profound spiritual system developed that continues up to the present day through the various lineages of Buddhist traditions from around the world. The Buddhist institutions of ancient India were extraordinary centers of research in the science of the mind the crown jewel among them all was nalanda with centuries of royal patronage nalanda became a dynamic beacon of learning and contemplation attracting the leading figures of the buddhist world to study within its walls nalanda university of ancient india is a uh, landmark in Indian educational, intellectual and spiritual tradition. Nalanda is the primary kind of institute, monastic institute, which uh, played a prominent role uh, in the development of uh, uh, not only the philosophical systems, uh, but also the epistemological system, the logic system and uh, many other fields of studies. for the first time in the entire world where every possible disciplines were studied on within a campus in the 7th century this wisdom tradition began to spread from india to tibet through the teachings of great spiritual masters such as acharya shantarakshita and guru padmasambhava the uh, the tradition that went to tibet is uh, not uh, you know in parts or in partial in form but it went in a very comprehensive manner first of all uh, it got the you know texts translated uh, uh, imported got them translated and then the knowledge system and then the spiritual lineage uh, was also you know uh, transmitted to tibet inspired by the knowledge systems of the nalanda tradition Tibetan Buddhist masters and scholars produced a vast amount of literature running into several thousand volumes. This was made possible through the work of the intrepid and dedicated translators, Lotsawas, meaning eyes of the world, 
who eventually made available almost the entire Buddhist canon from Sanskrit into Tibetan. And now it is over 5,000 you know, treatises which were translated, uh, which is uh, a record in human history. No translation uh, was allowed to be done just uh, single-handedly, but it sh must be done uh, in collaboration of both the Tibetan and uh, Indian you know, uh, scholar. Tibetan translators approached the Sanskrit originals with enormous care and respect. The texts were treated with such veneration that some were inscribed in gold ink and always began with an acknowledgement to the original Indian authors. The translation was so accurate. The Tibetan language itself was developed uh, uh, in a way so that it can capture the entire content of the Sanskrit. If you look at the technical details of uh, how translation was, you know, uh, done uh, at that point of time, uh, it is amazing. Even today, it is very challenging and difficult to maintain that kind of accuracy of a translation with such a precision. Over the centuries, Buddhism in India fell into decline, but beyond the Himalayas, on the high Tibetan plateau, Buddhist thought continued to develop in thousands of monastic institutions and in isolated places of spiritual retreat. Tragically, political events of the mid-20th century threw Tibet into turmoil as the Chinese Red Army pursued a policy of merciless destruction of Tibetan Buddhist culture. Just as Indian Buddhists had, centuries earlier, turned to Tibet as a sanctuary for the Buddha Dharma, Tibetans now turned to India to preserve and pass on their treasured Buddhist traditions. However, it was not long before the common spiritual ground between Indian and Tibetan Buddhism brought forth yet another harvest of shared knowledge, one that continues up to the present day. The Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies was the brainchild of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. His immediate responsibility was to take care of the basic needs of tens of thousands of his people who had arrived in India with nothing except the clothes they wore. Yet he held a broader vision to preserve Tibet's spiritual traditions. To this end, he worked to establish a center of higher education that would impart the collective wisdom of all the lineages of Tibetan Buddhism within a modern academic framework. Initially, the institute functioned as a special constituent wing of the Sanskrit University in Varanasi. Since the institute did not yet have its own dedicated facilities, the students and teachers shared classrooms and offices with the Sanskrit University and lived in rented spaces of various local temples and hostels. When there was no more room for the lessons to take place, they were held outside. These were difficult and challenging years for the young Tibetan students. We had to wake up at 5 a.m. Uh, catching the bus and classes uh, started at 7 a.m. When they come back, we are the last one because of being first. We came here around uh, 1 p.m., very hungry, thirsty, too tired, like that. After the retirement of the first principal, the eminent scholar Kyabje Zong Rinpoche, a young, brilliant scholar, Samdong Rinpoche, was appointed principal of the Tibetan University in 1971. Just five years later, 
There were over 250 students and 37 staff, and the institute had already produced 106 acharyas, or master-level students. The institute shifted to its new permanent home, not far from Sarnath. With its close proximity to Deer Park, the very place where the Buddha first turned the wheel of Dharma, it was as if the students of the institute had once again set in motion the rotation of that great wheel on Indian soil. At the institute's official founding on 28th of January 1978, hundreds of scholars from around the world attended, and congratulatory messages poured in from such eminent persons as Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, as well as from Indian ministers and foreign and Tibetan dignitaries. Dr. Kapila Vasyayan, a renowned scholar and then joint secretary of the Ministry of Culture, took a profound and far-reaching interest in the Institute. She became so loved by the students that she became known to them simply as Mataji, mother. With the construction of the hostels, classrooms, and library, the campus was now fully functioning as an independent center of learning. Special attention was paid to the landscaping to create a serene and tranquil environment suitable for study. Professor Samdong Rinpoche took great care to incorporate primary elements of traditional Tibetan architecture, ensuring that the campus environment embodied the Institute's overarching goals and objectives. To inculcate moral values in the heart and mind of the students with the view to develop an integrated personality. To restore lost and incomplete Sanskrit texts preserved in Tibetan translation. To provide traditional Tibetan education enriched by modern subjects for students from Tibetan exile community and students from Himalayan regions of India. And from neighboring countries who sought a higher education in Buddhist studies in Tibet before 1959. To preserve Tibetan cultural heritage, including the language, literature, religion, philosophy, and the arts. To provide degrees in traditional Indo-Tibetan Buddhist subjects within the framework of a modern university. As a result of the efforts and dedication of all involved, and with the support of the Government of India, the Central Institute for Higher Tibetan Studies rose to become a center of excellence attracting the leading figures from around the world. The beating heart of the Institute is the research departments. It is here since 1980 that the vital work of restoring texts from Tibetan to their original Sanskrit has been carried out. As Indian and Tibetan scholars began to interact with one another, it became clear that although they had arrived as refugees with few material possessions, the Tibetans had brought with them a vast wealth of knowledge that offered a vital link to India's long-lost Buddhist heritage. Most of those uh, original texts in Sanskrit uh, got lost in course of time and uh, so um, uh, many of the uh, lost Sanskrit text uh, uh, treatises and works are being translated or re restored back into uh, Sanskrit from Tibetan sources. Sanskrit and Tibetan language are very close to each other and there are many sentences that actually match word to word with Tibetan language. We can read Sanskrit and we can read Tibetan together. So this is one of the most authentic translations, I think, in the world, maybe. On those days, when, whenever they do translation, they do translation with uh, one Indian pundit, Indian scholar, as a subject, a subject expert, and the Tibetan translator as a, a language expert, as well as he or she should know the content of the text also. This system 
is coming way back from 8th to 9th century. So now we are here also in the, in the restoration department following that pattern and we are working with a Sanskrit uh, scholar. Now the role of the people has changed a little bit. We are the subject expert and the Sanskrit uh, they are language experts now. <laughs> this is the change of the role now, you see. We have to discuss a lot. And sometimes for one sentence it will take like one hour to, do, to, to put a right. <laughs> For Indian scholars, it was very difficult to go through uh, Mahayana Buddhism, particularly uh, because the texts are not were not available and Tibetan texts uh, were not available. Uh, Indian scholars could, didn't understand Tibetan in the form of uh, Dalai Lama's uh, uh, arrival uh, and uh, establishment of such institutions and the work of Tibetan scholars in India. Uh, the, uh, the beauty of Mahayana Buddhism is being introduced to India. Uh, the wealth of Mahayana Buddhism is uh, uh, brought to the humanity uh, through the activity here. Uh, and I think that is uh, very important. Yadyapi, I am a Sanatan Hindu Dharma. Then I am a part of Bodh Shikshan, which is related to our lives. जिनके बिना जनजीवन सफल नहीं हो सकता है हमारे जीवन की विसंगतियां दूर नहीं हो सकती हैं तो मैंने फिर बौद्ध साहित्य बौद्ध धर्म दर्शन का भी अध्ययन इस संस्था के माध्यम से किया अगर मैं इस संस्था से नहीं जुड़ता तो मैं इतने अच्छे महत्वपूर्ण परोपकारी जनोपयोगी बौद्ध दर्शन विषय से मैं अछूता रह जाता Two generations of Tibetan and Indian scholars have now worked together at the Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies. Their work has led to dozens of publications, including the works of many scholars of the Nalanda tradition through the university's own publishing unit. In the translation department, scholars work on the editing of Tibetan and Sanskrit texts and the restoration of lost Sanskrit texts with the help of Tibetan translations. They also work on first translations of important Sanskrit texts into Tibetan. Besides English, this unit also produces many translations of Buddhist works so that the Indian public can read Buddhist literature in their own language. The Rare Buddhist Text Department works on critical editions of rare Sanskrit manuscripts with a focus on Tantric texts mostly from Nepal. The Dictionary Department produces dictionaries from Tibetan to Sanskrit and Sanskrit to Tibetan that are also available in digital format to support the work of Buddhist scholars and researchers around the world. The Center for Tibetan Literature produces works on the history of Tibetan literature spanning over several centuries. Om Yo Brahmanam Vidadhati Purvam Yo Vai Vedans Chaprahinoti Tasmai The Institute has become an important intersectional forum between Buddhist and non-Buddhist philosophical schools and hosts regular seminars and conferences. Practice of Shila, practice of Shamatha, practice of Vibhasana, we are saying, the Hindus, Buddhist, like twin brothers, truly. Today I'm going to talk about the nature of mind from the neuroscience and physics perspective. The Institute has established itself as a premier research institution for Buddhist studies with significant contributions to global scholarship. Visiting scholars and academics from India and abroad are received throughout the year and regular exchange programs are run with Indian and foreign universities. For nearly 30 years, the Tibetan Institute has been involved in intensive exchange with colleges and universities in Australia and the United States, and more recently, other universities in Asia. Joint research programs have been initiated, important publications achieved. These exchange programs have truly allowed the Central Institute of Tibetan Studies to contribute to global Tibetan and Buddhist studies. Tell me 
and all those uh, people who have been instrumental in making this institution a international institution of repute we feel proud of you Ethics and values are integral to the subjects taught at the Institute through its roots in the teachings of the Buddha and Buddhist masters. What we learned here is ancient Buddhist texts which talks about the nature of reality and its characteristics. Somehow when you know a little part of that knowledge it gives you some inner satisfaction that really helps in developing oneself to become the best version of one's own self. Even in modern subjects such as political history, economics and modern languages, attempts are made to present the material in ways that encourage a value-centered approach. Which grew more and more profound on account of the intense winter cold. The Buddhist, you know, uh, treatises of uh, different disciplines and schools which are being taught here uh, are primarily focused on moral value, which means transform transformation of uh, the person. Tenzin Nima Negi is a PhD candidate of Indian Buddhist philosophy. He runs a number of charitable projects and teaches Buddhism in Himalayan communities. After uh, studying in the, this university for last almost uh, 12 years, there are lots of great transformation came, on, came in me. It brought me a great change that now I can connect with the society, uh, especially in, in terms of Buddhist philosophy. My personality it is really improving day by day. So in terms of connecting with the people, in terms of understanding the uh, problems of the society, in terms of uh, dealing with the problems that I face, and this is uh, because of the education being imparted here the quality of education being imparted here. There are five academic faculties, with about 80 staff serving around 500 students. The Buddhist philosophy faculty includes instruction on Indian Buddhist philosophy as well as all the major traditions of Tibetan Buddhism. One <laughs> The Faculty of Classical and Modern Languages teaches Tibetan, Sanskrit, Pali, Hindi and English. This faculty also oversees the Center for Teacher Education, where future teachers are trained to serve in Tibetan schools in India. The Faculty of Social Sciences has four departments, Tibetan History, Asian History, Political Science, and Economics. The Faculty of Fine Arts maintains departments of traditional Tibetan painting and woodcraft. Every aspect of Tibetan art is deeply rooted in Buddhist philosophy. The Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies was the very first institute in India to offer traditional Tibetan fine arts at degree level. The students are instructed in art theory, aesthetics and philosophy of art, as well as in global art history.
There is also a faculty of Tibetan medicine that includes a department of Tibetan astro sciences and astrology. Although Tibetan medicine proved very popular in India, it was not recognized as part of the Indian health system. The Dalai Lama asked the Vice Chancellor, Venerable Professor Geshe Nawang Samton, to lead the way in establishing official recognition of Sowa Rigpa under Ayush, the Indian Health Ministry. I approached the uh, Ayush Ministry of the Central Government uh, and uh, they were very supportive and then they constituted a committee and that committee was supposed to look into the uh, comparison between Ayurveda and uh, Tibetan medicine. Professor Nawang Samton engaged in a rigorous and comprehensive study of Tibetan medicine to build the case for recognition under the government of India. The committee found that uh, almost around 30 to 35 percent of the Tibetan medicine has a contribution from Indian medical system, uh, but then it has its own kind of history going back to more than 3,000 years and then evolved in course of time in a very, uh, you know, uh, uh, rich manner. In a very, with a very sophisticated and uh, profound kind of uh, philosophy and uh, the principles and a very rich practice. The campus has its own clinic of Tibetan medicine that serves not only the students and staff but the local Indian community as well. In Tibetan medicine even if there are five different patients of same disease, they are given, you know, different treatments. When it gives a treatment, it uh, treats the individual person looking into, into the physiological nature and the, you know, psychosomatic nature of the individual person and then gives the individual treatment. <laughs> The future would be really, really bright because we are not lacking any of the literatures, manuscripts, pharmacopias, everything is there. The Tibetan medicine, <clears throat> it can play a really good role. And uh, not only for public health itself, uh, for these emerging diseases also, we can, I mean, uh, manage those really well. The Shantarakshita Library has evolved from an initial modest collection of a few thousand books stacked on shelves in a rented room to one of the most comprehensive resources for the study and research of Buddhist and Tibetan studies in the world. It houses all the key texts of the five main Indian philosophical schools and is a treasury of Indo-Tibetan Buddhist transmissions in Tibetan translations. The library utilizes the latest in digital technology for the preservation of rare manuscripts. The library also acquires collections of texts in the field, taking the research staff to some of the remotest and rugged locations to work often for weeks on end to digitize the texts so as to ensure that they survive the rigors of time and the elements. Wherever we stay in a society, okay, so Tibetan ordination 
according to Buddhism, intuitive organization, that is very important. So when we work as a, a teamwork, then we will have good result and also for the reader also, okay. If there is a combination gap or egoism like that one, then problem. So the main thing is uh, teamwork is important, I think. कि हाँ हम लोग हर छोटे बड़े कार्यक्रम में एक इकाई न हो करके पूरे विश्वविद्यालय को एक परिवार मान करके काम करते हैं और पूरे विश्वविद्यालय के विकास को अपना विकास समझते हैं दिस इंस्टीट्यूट हैज नॉट ओनली बीन एन एकेडमिक सेंटर फॉर स्टूडेंट्स बट हैज ऑल्सो बीन अ होम फॉर मैनी दे आर मैनी अंडर प्रिविलेज स्टूडेंट एंड दे आर मैनी स्टूडेंट्स फ्रॉम ड्राइवर्स बैकग्राउंड and they all have some sort of a sense of community or a sense of belonging here in this institute and many of them became like abbot of the great monasteries and uh, many of them became the director of many institutions and many of them became like uh, Buddhist teachers translators teachers in uh, every level of of the school from primary to the university level So it's a really great result. Now we need to have a take on how we should preserve this uh, age-old tradition. Uh, not only simply it is uh, uh, to be preserved because it is uh, Tibetan or the ancient, but because this tradition is, uh, you know, very beneficial for the entire humanity. Samagate, 